So four or five o'clock in the afternoon, um, you're going to be stronger. And that doesn't, and, and the, the impressive part about this, it's men, it's women, a variety of different ages. Uh, the exercises range from things like grip strength to sort of leg extension kinds of things. And it's tremendously consistent, which isn't always true in human research, that strength is better in the afternoon. And at this stage, people have, you know, looked at, is it the nerve? It, and there's no indication it's, it's uh, how the nervous system is recruiting the muscles. It seems to be something locally at the level of the muscle. And so uh, that's one example where we have some evidence that likely the clock is playing a role and sort of, you know, under regular conditions, you are stronger. You're going to be stronger in the afternoon. Now, why? I, I don't, you know, we don't have a why for that, but that's how it works. The other one that uh, some of my colleagues from the Netherlands have shown is that, you know, the, you know, the mitochondria in the muscle cells, so the, the powerhouses, the things that make all the energy, um, they have a higher capacity in the afternoon. Just to make sure I've got this, this is your body clock through 24 hours changing the way that your muscles work. And interesting, you're saying like across men and women, and it sounds like you said a lot of different studies, you can actually see that this strength is peaking surprisingly late in the day. You're saying sort of four to five in the afternoon, which I rather think is like sort of the day is sort of... Yeah, I don't want to be too precise here because, you know, it, but, but I'd say afternoon. So I'd say, let's just say from two on. <laughs> Depends when you wake up, I guess, is what you're saying, is that when my afternoon and your afternoon might be different. But that's really, that's really fascinating. Is that also constant as we age? We don't know. If I had to make a prediction, I would say we'd lose our day-night difference based on what I understand with the timer. But, but that, ha that actually hasn't been tested um, with, with a... I mean, it's been looked at maybe up to about 30 years old, but but again, I, I don't think we've actually moved those studies into sort of the over 50 crowd. So in general, do we see our circadian rhythms um, like become weaker as we age? What is it that makes you think that that's what's likely to be happening? We talked about the clock mechanism, which is the same in every single cell, right? So you have this timer where my research has been and where people don't really talk about it in terms of trying to apply it to the physiology is that beyond timekeeping, it has another job, all right? So it actually has a second job that from a physiological perspective is critically important, and that is to regulate a set of genes at different times of day. Can you help us to under understand that? Because I think most people listening to this will be like, hang on, my genes are just this fixed thing. What does that mean? to regulate a set of genes at a different time of day. Could you just help us to under understand what you just said? So you have this timer that has sort of cog or like gears on it, right? And those gears t touch different parts, different sets of genes at different times of day. There are some genes that are constant, but there are a number of genes. So let's say over a thousand genes in a muscle cell are expressed in a pattern where they're higher at some times and lower at others. And does this mean, like, because genes are sort of a bit like instructions, aren't they, to do something? So is this sort of saying you're basically this 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 muscle cell is being told, hey, at, you know, four in the afternoon, do all the things that are going to set you up to be the strongest you possibly can. But at three in the morning, you should be working, switch on all the repair, switch off all of the special turbocharging stuff, switch on different functions that you want to be happening in this cell at different time of day. Absolutely. So, so one way to think about the clock and, or the way we, you know, is that it is a anticipatory timer. So it's based on, you know, the fact that our, that, that we have these changes in what we do at different times of day and that we do. And, and, and so what you will see is before you wake up in your muscle, you will see sets of genes that are getting turned on and those will make for proteins. And those things are going to be involved in metabolism or breakdown of like fats and carbohydrates that will provide the energy for you to use your muscle. 
your muscle is basically getting ready to be used. You know, you're still lying in bed, but it knows that you're going to be waking up in an hour and it's going to start doing these things so that it's ready because you're going to have to get up and you have to get the kids ready for school and you're going to walk them to school or whatever it is. You can start doing a bunch of stuff and it doesn't just get turned on instantly. It's not like we're a bit used to our phones can do anything instantly, but actually... This is more like these machines need to be warmed up and ready and with all the right things. And so this is doing that in over quite a long period, right? You're not talking about just minutes here. Correct. Your idea of the warm up is perfect, right? So so the, the what the clock is doing is it is changing things without you having to think about it. It's changing things in your muscle that get your muscle ready for once you get out of bed and do all those things you're going to do, Right. And then at a different time of the day, it's going to be doing something different. And that will be related to storage of sugar, storage of uh, replacement of proteins that may be damaged. So it knows you're going to be resting or, you know, it assumes you're going to be resting. And, and so it's getting those specific genes expressed to do the jobs it wants to be doing during that rest phase. So, I mean, why don't we start with me? I'm in my late 40s. Um, what does this tell you about both what is like good in terms of how I would think about the timing of my exercise or being physically active, but also, I guess, what would be suboptimal? With what we understand about the natural rhythms of the clocks in our muscles, um, then, you know, if you are able to, I mean, exercising in the afternoon is probably when your body and when your muscles are um, best set for doing that, right? You're stronger, you in, you know, based on the mitochondrial measures, you, you know, the endurance should be good. It's a very nuanced question. And so I'm trying, I'm struggling with trying Not to find all. the Karen, ways. Karen, one, one of the things I love about this show always is whenever you speak to the people who are like the absolute world experts in something, they're always much more cautious about the advice than when you talk to somebody who's like a long way away from it, hasn't maybe done the research themselves. Right. It's uh, where they tend to make very strong statements. So I think we are used to the fact that... Um, you know, that this is cutting edge science, that the results, you know, may in, in fact be re- reinterpreted. And so uh, I understand the caution. If I play it back, what I think you're saying is that, you know, right now the evidence is that there is a change during the day, that you are stronger starting from the afternoon, and that that implies that that's a better time to exercise. And I think you're also saying that you haven't carried out all the randomized control trials to sort of prove this yet? Is it, would that be a... Um, that would uh, be correct. And then there, the, the other part that we haven't talked about is what time you exercise actually feeds into the muscle clock. So talk about, okay. help, help me to understand what you're saying. So, so just like light adjusts the clock in the brain. Right. What time you exercise adjusts your muscle clocks people often talk about the fact that if you do have jet lag, then sort of doing exercise in the place that you go to can be helpful. And I just assumed that that was something to do with like, you know, just being more active or something. But but you're saying that actually that might contribute to adjusting in the same way that the light is supposed to Absolutely. Adjust. And feeding. And again, I right, love sorry, that you say so that. Like it's if, you, if you're on audio, you won't see Karen looking at me as though I'm a complete idiot because it's obvious no, no. that this is going to change <laughs> the time zone. But I'm quite surprised. So to explain a little bit what happens, you're saying... You can perform exercise at different times of day. And depending on when you exercise, it will change the, the, the settings or the phase of the muscle clock uh, independent. So the, the clock in the brain does not change, um, but the muscle clocks will shift sort of directionally toward, I, I call it sort of toward the time of the exercise. What we now understand is that there is information that's coming from that exercise, that exercise at that particular time that's telling the muscle clock, hey, this might be something we're going to be doing more often. Let's let's adjust so we're going to be ready for this, right? So if we think about the clock being an anticipatory mechanism, if all of a sudden you start exercising at six in the morning, the clocks in your muscles are going to shift more there. It's learning. It's in training. It's adapting to that time. So you are going to be better prepared or your muscles are going to be better prepared to perform that activity at that time. And Karen, does that affect your own, like your body clocks 
elsewhere as well. So if I'm doing this exercise, does that start to drag all my other body clocks also in that direction? Well, it it can. Um, it's it's not a simple answer. It's not like all the other peripheral tissues come along. No, um, but we have evidence that the the clocks in your fat will change. The clocks in your lungs will change. So it's definitely, so, it's not just the muscles. There is this, correct. hence you saying, like, it's obvious that if you were jet lagged, you should do exercise, it's going to help you to move. Absolutely, I, absolutely. It, it makes me suddenly think, because we talk about jet lag as, as traveling to somewhere else, but there will be a lot of people listening to this who do shift work. So there might be nurses mm. or doctors or whatever it is who have to go through, um, like, these effectively this massive jet lag for themselves um, where there is no light. In fact, they're fighting against the light. What would, what does this imply about, um, you know, anything to do with exercise being able to be helpful to manage that, you know, moving on to shift and, and moving off? Yeah, I, I, again, it's an area, it's a great question. There's very little data in that area. But I think, I mean, I, you know, this is, this would be one of those things where I'd talk to the people who do exercise on shift and they could help the scientists uh, design the experiment in some ways. Because, a lot of times people figure out what makes them feel best and, you know, when the exercise makes them feel best. You know, there's data out with sleep deprivation and exercise and the benefits that come with that. Aspects of sleep deprivation are circadian in nature. And so um, the prediction is this is this, it will be beneficial. And again, it will vary depending on whether you're a swing shift type person or if you're a very consistent shift type person. Um, I think hopefully there are people in that area now figuring these things out. And based upon what you know now, so someone's listening and saying, like, that's great, you're going to have better answers in five years' time. But Karen, <laughs> are you saying you should be trying to do some exercise, therefore, in the shift, because that's going to help to make the, let's say you're doing this for some long period of time, right? So it's not just for an, a day or two, but it's a, a week. Are you saying mm -hmm. that, you you know, you don't want to sit in your, you know, somehow like I, the activity I, levels would help. Right. What do you... I mean, you know, based on what we understand right now, I, I would suggest exercising before you start your work, before you start your shift, rather than at the end of the shift. But that's, you know, again, I, my caution is, is that, you know, there's still much to be learned. But I think having that exercise before you start will be bene more beneficial.